This week, as we edge closer to the end of the year, we continue our theme of mental health on the farm and begin a series focusing on stress and isolation in agriculture. In part one, we meet Nathan Casburn of Sumner, Mississippi. His story is all too familiar and made possible through the extraordinary efforts of producer James Parker and MSU Films. <laughs> Mississippi Delta, specifically Sumner. The farm is roughly 1,500 acres, give or take. This year we're primarily soybeans. Been a family farm since early 1900s. Family house. My dad and I work together. As of this year, it is just the two of us. How do two people possibly work 1,500 acres? <laughs> Slowly, difficultly, and uh, painstakingly. We get it done, though. This is not what I want to be doing. But it wouldn't be a normal day on a farm if you didn't have an unexpected fire to have to put out. That's just the name of the game. Farming's a very tough life. You know, you have a lot of risks that you have going in, and people don't think about that. You know, people don't think about how one storm can completely wipe your crop out and you know, put you back to square one. Or, and really, you know, no fault of your own. I think a lot of people think that it's just easy. You just put stuff in the ground and then just go count your money in the fall. They see a lot of numbers that people like, people like to spout off statistics, but you don't see all the overhead behind it and everything like that. You don't see the, the work that goes into it. You don't see 10, 12 hours in the sun. You know, you don't see stuff constantly breaking down that's out of your control. And then part suppliers being out of control uh, COVID coming in, a, a global pandemic coming in and shutting down supply lines of parts and making parts availability impossible. At the end of the day, you, you're never, you, there's never enough hours in the day to do what you want to do. But you do what you can and wake up the next day and start over. It can be extremely stressful. It's really not what I expected to be part of my life forever. I didn't, I didn't intend to farm. I kind of felt like I didn't belong and I didn't want to be here. But things don't always work out like we planned. 2004, I was a junior in high school and I had been drinking, you know, a lot of folks around here start drinking early. The Delta's a drinking culture, it just is. We had a car wreck. My girlfriend at the time was driving on a back road. She was pretty badly injured. I, I wasn't as badly injured, but I still broke my back in a couple spots and I was given a couple prescriptions of, of painkillers. I remember sitting, on, sitting in the chair, there's a recliner at the house, and I felt like I was floating. And I was like, this is the greatest feeling ever. I want this to last forever. And I, I was gonna do whatever I could to make that last forever. Usually it starts where people are using for 
a reason other than the original intended consequence. And with that, that's where you can easily have it spiral out of control because then it starts becoming that coping mechanism. And the more you do that, the more you rely on any substance for your coping, the less able you're gonna be able to naturally cope. And so it's really a catch-22. They were cheap, $20 would get you whatever you wanted, you know, and that's, I realized that I could just go spend 100 bucks and be good for the week. But then that, that $100 is only good for three days. Then it's only good for one day. then you make that jump to heroin. It just escalates, and it's out of your control whether or not you realize it. You keep trying to keep that control over it, keep that grasp on it, but you can't. I would, I would show up work hungover. I would show up withdrawn. Well, I, I don't ever think I knew that I was withdrawn at the time, but I would, I would show up. One thing I would do is I would show up no matter how miserable I felt. I'd be two hours of sleep, hung over, but I would still be at work. And I would use that as an incentive. If I work a few hours, you know, I can start drinking, or I got this coming in at this time, and I can go ahead and do this, and I'll be better. It, it wasn't for years that it got to the point that it was causing me issues with work, which that came, but for years it didn't. And withdrawal symptoms are almost always the exact opposite of whatever the drug does. So something that makes you feel happy and good will actually make you feel sad and depressed coming off of it. And the way to take those away is to take more of the substance. So as people go on, you actually start using the substance just to feel normal. You know, not even to feel better, just to feel normal. I'm overdosing at least once a day. And I've got a, I'm, I teach a buddy of mine how to do CPR because it's gotten to that point. What I'm doing, I've isolated myself so much that it's just me and the drugs, and it's the point where I'm either gonna get clean or I'm gonna die. I kind of have a, I don't know if you call it existential moment, but it was kind of an out of body moment where I sucked out of my own system and I was able to kind of see everything for the truth of how it is. I was stuck in this pattern. Get high, sit on the couch. And I, I, I couldn't, I physically couldn't go beyond that. I was supposed to have been at work and I couldn't do, I couldn't do anything about it and I wasn't even enjoying it. No matter how much I didn't want to do it, I couldn't stop myself from doing it. And I just had this moment where I, was, I saw, uh, I just saw for how it was. I just saw that I was going through the same thing and I was, I was stuck. I was never gonna move beyond where I was currently. I wasn't, I wasn't gonna go anywhere. Everyone else around me was gonna, was moving on and I was going to be right here and for how long I was going to be right there I didn't know. It was a very sudden this is how life is and it's not going to get any better unless you do something about it moment. Once you hit that moment and once you you know really get that get to that spot where you're open to change, where you realize that there has to be change. Now, that's a life-changing moment. It's that fork in the road where it's, it's forcing you to make a choice, and you realize that status quo only leads one place, and you have to decide if that's, if that's where you want to go or not. You know, are you going to the grave, or are you going to build up and get out of this? I cut my phone off, because, and I left it at the house, because I knew that if I had my phone with me, I was going to call somebody to bring me something or go get something. I finished out the work day and dove headfirst into recovery. And that was fall of two, late October 2016, and that's what I've been doing ever since. Afterwards, what it looked like for me is working on relationships with people I work with, which include family, my dad and I, you know, 
it's, it's, we've gotten a lot closer because our relationship, we hardly had a relationship. If I'd been him, I would have fired me and run me off and I would have deserved every bit of it because I was extremely hard to be around, extremely hard to deal with, but he never did. And I appreciate that and I've appreciated the last couple years because I've been present for it. It's been really good for work and everything else because it's allowed me to learn so much and to grow in my knowledge of farm work and be able to become a better farmer. Take over a lot of the responsibility that I've been able to and actually step up and do what I'm supposed to do. You know what I mean? This year in particular has been probably the hardest year of my life, but it's also been the most rewarding year of my life. I've accomplished a lot, but you have to work at that and it doesn't come overnight. It's been a process over the last three and a half years. It's, you know, may have been bad choices, may have been bad, bad circumstances, but however you got there, in a way it doesn't matter. It's about what you do going forward. And ultimately that's how we mar leave our mark on the world, right? It's, it's what we do, it's not really even where we've been. Sometimes actually the greatest stories start from the worst places. Well, before I knew it was just a job. There was something that I had to do because I had to have money and to support my habit. And if I didn't show up, then I got fired. I was, that, that was as invested in it as I, was, as I ever was. I, didn't, I never really looked at it for what it was. I wasn't capable of looking at it for what it was. And now it's a lifestyle as well as a profession that's not a job. The biggest hurdle is being able to say, I can't do this on my own, and I need, I, need, I need help with this. And that is the most terrifying, difficult thing to do. But once you get past that, and you realize it's not so hard to do, then a lot of other stuff is doable. And once you've made that transition, you can pretty much do anything, including getting clean, staying that way. Very important, if you or someone you know is in emotional crisis, call or text 988 anytime for confidential free crisis support. Yeah.